All right. Good morning. My name is Angie Hacker. I'm one of the co-facilitators of the Tribal Climate and Health Adaptation webinar series. And today our focus is going to be on uh, talking with the Southern Great Plains cohort of the, the training series that we're, we're doing right now. Uh, today is the Remote Group Technical Assistance Day. However, we are in the middle of the pandemic crisis and um, our small cohort uh, is probably otherwise engaged. So what we're doing today is we're recording this session um, and we're going to share as much information as we can. We are super fortunate to have somebody here with us from the region who is an expert and gonna help fill in some gaps for me on talking about what's going on in the Southern Great Plains. And then we'll distribute this to folks afterwards. So we have, uh, we, this was scheduled for up to two hours. This will probably be shorter because we won't have as much discussion, um, but that's that's the plan for today. So we are, uh, this is our agenda for the day. Um, our focus was really here on the Southern Plains region. I have found that Southern Plains gets defined differently by different organizations, but for our purposes, we were really pulling from the people that had registered for our training that were from Oklahoma, Texas, Kansas, and Louisiana, and the ones that had signed up for this cohort were actually all, I think, located in Oklahoma. Um, there are only four or so people, I think, from that from our attendees that wanted to be part of this cohort, um, but this can be distributed more widely than that, um, and so we're going to talk a little bit more broadly about the region. The region, according to the National Climate Assessment, actually contains 45 federally recognized tribes, or 48 um, if we're including state recognized tribes that are in the Southern Great Plains area. Uh, our agenda for today is really to go through quick introductions. We're gonna go through a little overview of what's going on in the region in terms of exposures and impacts, along with regional re resources, so stuff that's specific to the Southern Great Plains region. And um, probably in the absence of having a whole lot of attendees today um, will have a limited discussion on regional knowledge, experiences, ideas, and needs. And then I want to demonstrate for you a few of the tribal climate health and adaptation tools that we've developed. And then there's um, a little extra time at the end in case, somebody, in case any of the tribes join us for a little extra technical assistance and Q&A. Okay. So just a reminder about the purpose of these cohorts. Uh, we, when we originally proposed a grant for these trainings, we had decided that we wanted to do technical assistance remote workshops that were more designed specifically for regions. And so while the, the national webinar series is really allowing us to do, um, to train a lot of people at once across the country, it doesn't allow us to do a deep dive on what's going on in specific regions. And so we'll talk today a little bit more about unique climate and health exposures, impacts and strategies of selected regional cohorts, um, which of which uh, Southern Great Plains was one of five. <clears throat> and it's really intended to supplement the national training um, by leveraging and sharing region specific knowledge, data, partnerships and other opportunities and resources. And to the extent possible, we do have a listserv for this cohort to the extent possible that we can help engage folks with each other and help build relationships across region, across the region, across disciplines, um, and help foster more collaboration. We'd be super happy if that occurred. And so we'll be doing more follow-ups over that email discussion listserv. And so I'm just gonna give April Taylor a chance to introduce herself since she's joining us today. And she is certainly one of the region's um, premier experts in climate change. So. Uh, April, could you introduce yourself? Just tell us your name, organization, location, and your role in climate change. Hi, I'm April Taylor. I'm a Chickasaw Nation employee officed at the South Central Climate Adaptation Science Center in Norman, Oklahoma. And my role is I'm a tribal liaison for climate change for Oklahoma, New Mexico, Texas, and Louisiana. Um, so we provide technical assistance on um, finding the right climate data and um, understanding that type of data and climate science. Um, we provide trainings. So we have 
we did our first training on this topic on tribal health in December and brought in Angie uh, for that as an example. And then we also do, uh, we have a research arm. So we're, uh, we fund uh, tribal projects and collaborate on uh, research related to climate change. Um, and so we have um, some dollars to fund projects. Thanks so much for being here, April. April has been one of our MVP advisors for the Tribal Climate Health Project uh, over the last several years, giving us lots of guidance. So um, she and I are basically going to have a discussion and she's going to fill in some gaps as we walk through region specific information. Okay, so I have been taking a little bit closer of a look at some of the national scale literature on what's going on in the Southern Great Plains clim uh, climate exposures and your impacts. And so on the right, you probably remember from the webinar series. This is the framework that we use when we talk about drivers, exposures, and impacts, so the cascading effects of climate change. And those five key exposures um, are, are do apply fairly significantly to the Southern Great Plains region. And so we do hear a lot about temperature extremes. We hear a bit about wildfire, storms, including hurricanes, definitely drought uh, affecting the aquifers in the area. <clears throat> as well as uh, not so much melting ice affecting you directly, but sea level rise, at least in some of your coastal communities, such as Louisiana. And so some of the key messages that are coming from some of that national literature include uh, rising temperatures that are leading to increased demand for water and energy. And in parts of the region, this will constrain development, stress natural resources, and increase competition for water. And there's a lot of attention in the Southern Great Plains on agricultural practices. Agricultural practices may, you know, there's some maybe short-term positive temporary news in terms of heat and crop productivity, but in the long run and overall, especially with drought, um, we're seeing some adverse effects to agricultural practices that could lead to certain levels of food insecurity and economic insecurity. And those, you know, so what we're hearing in the national literature is that new agricultural practices will be needed to cope with changing conditions. Um, whereas the Northern Great Plains is expected to see higher levels of precipitation overall, the Southern Great Plains is expected to see lower levels of precipitation and to some extent has already experienced that as well as greater evaporation due to the increased heat levels. And so both of those things combined are expected to accelerate depletion of water resources, such as in your High Plains aquifer. Um, we also hear about extreme events, such as storms, hurricanes, and wildfire. Um, and maybe we can hear a little bit more from April about how those are affecting tribes, specifically in the Southern Great Plains. And um, the literature talks specifically too about communities that are already the most vulnerable to weather and climate extremes. And those are often including things like elders, elderly, um, community members, but certainly those tribes that are in the Southern Great Plains are considered particularly vulnerable. Um, we also hear in the Southern Great Plains quite a bit about vectors. So um, the habits and habitats and breeding patterns of vectors will change with climate change. It has already changed with climate change in terms of its seasonality, its spread and distribution. And so we'd be talking about mosquitoes, ticks, rodents and fleas, and the diseases that come along with them. And we mentioned, in, particularly in Louisiana, coastal sea level rise that is affecting some tribes. So uh, I have a little discussion here, and maybe April can fill in about what are some experience happening in tri with tribes in the Southern Great Plains, and what health impacts are those communities facing? Um, so obviously heat is a big one um, for us. Uh, we, we're used to having the heat, but having more intense and um, more days of heat is going to be a major concern for us, um, especially um, during festivals and, and events that we have during the summertime. Um, so there are tribes that are planning for that and investing in uh, ways to keep cool or to um, have um, 
emergency management staff on hand and trained for heat and um, heat related illnesses, whether that's heat strokes or um, children um, with heat related um, symptoms in those events. Um, for example, we also have a lot of um, flooding. Um, so we had a, some major flooding in eastern Oklahoma um, in the recent years um, that, um, I mean, you're talking weeks upon weeks of water um, and having to be on generators and water quality concerns, um, cattle, having to move cattle and um, all sorts of flood related impacts um, and and obviously those also are um, those that potentially could be injured or in a, a car or um, other types of um, response for flooding um, during the event. Uh, we've also had, um, as Angie mentioned, several uh, large hurricanes, so with Hurricane Harvey and um, and all of those related issues um, related to the flooding um, as well. Where I could go on and on about all sorts of things that are impacted. Um, like the flooding in Houston, did that end up impacting any tribal communities or was that so we have um, Alabama Cushada in Eastern Texas um, and they're in the evacuation route as well. And so um, definitely major impacts. Many of their citizens live down in the Beaumont and down toward Houston area. Um, we have um, major droughts as well. And so issues with water scarcity, um, many of our communities are are dealing with um, you know, no backup supply or, or means for water and water quality under those conditions um, as well. Yes, I yes. actually read Alabama. somewhere that uh, the South Central area is actually home to the most, the majority of the United States emergency declarations. Is that, does that sound right to you? It's because of that gradient that we have. We have everything, right? So we have the the floods to the droughts, and we have those sort of that variability from one end to the next. Yeah. Um, so we have what I call, or what climate scientists refer to as cascading events. So when you have one to, right after the next one, so you may have a large flyer, and then you have the flood that comes with it, right? Like it's. Right you're gonna get more of them. So planning for multiple events and multiple extremes right. um, and those sort of, you have to plan for everything here. And so the all these secondary exposures that we talk about, um, I think are applicable to your area, certainly food insecurity, water insecurity, vector changes. Um, what about worsened air quality? I think you guys are in an area where air quality is typically fairly good, at least better than in parts of the Southwest where I am. Are you seeing changes <laughs> to your air quality? Um, so the tribes do have air quality programs. And so we have good data on those types of things. Um, so we obviously see um, spikes when the, when the fires come through. It's really cool because it's a clear signal um, and you can see those on the satellites and see where the air quality should be bad and um, and things like that and but yeah I don't I don't think of any tribes that are dealing with major climate change concerns with air quality right like high um, levels of ozone or things like that I would say the only tribe that I've worked with that it came up as an issue was again Alabama Cushada because of the Houston. Um, and all the oil and gas production down that way. Right. Um, but that, again, that's not a, a direct <laughs> impact due to climate change. Um, it's obviously uh, would be um, related to our society and our decisions that are driving, you know, the emissions 
and things like that. So if we were to um, transition and mitigate our um, our greenhouse gases, that obviously would help with uh, with air quality type issues like that. That's right. Uh, and of course, you know, you did mention storms and flooding, flooding being severe. Of course, in the aftermath of that, we'd be experiencing things like indoor air quality concerns related to mold. So that's one way that air quality could also be impact impacted. Right, absolutely. So yeah, I think you mentioned a lot of the potential public health risks that result from these exposures. I'll just run through a few of them that have popped out in the literature for for me, um, you mentioned heat-related illness, which can also lead to premature death. Um, we talked about vector-borne disease a little, but some examples of the types of vector-borne diseases that are experienced, potentially already endemic in the Southern Great Plains area are hantavirus, which could come as a result of rodents, West Nile virus um, from mosquitoes, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, dengue, and Zika. Those are some of the vector-borne diseases that I'm aware of. April, are there others that you all are tracking there? Um, yeah, so we uh, at the center, we are partnering or working with a mosquito specialist or researcher. And so he's, um, I think, yellow, fe yellow fever, or there's another one that he's really interested in. Um, in, a, in addition to West Nile. Um, and so there unfortunately isn't good data on um, the mosquito monitoring side of things. Um, and so, but we've had many of these um, in our region and in Oklahoma. Right. Um, so also, along with vector-borne disease, physical injury, sort of direct injuries from, or population displacement from extreme events, for example, the floods that we've been talking about. Uh, I don't know if the tribes have good data on the number of actual injuries that have occurred as a result of some of these um, sort of catastrophic storms, um, but uh, I'm sure you're in an area where those things are somewhat being tracked by region. Also, oops, excuse me, disruptions to water supply availability. That chart there on the right uh, is talking about water supplies, um, the projections for water supplies beginning to decline. And so the point of this chart that's trying to make is actually <clears throat> that even without climate change effects, water supplies are projected to decline by 2050, according to what they're calling the Water Supply Sustainability Risk Index. Um, but with climate change effects, then you see a far more severe scenario of water supply um, supplies projections of declining levels. And so what I thought was interesting here is how badly the Southern Great Plains looks like it will be affected. So certainly in the extreme area all throughout the Southern Great Plains. Um, with that, with drought, with uh, declining supplies, um, you tend to see disease due to drinking water and fish contamination. So as you, your supplies are drying up, you have sort of less dilution of your chemicals, your toxins, your pathogens, and other germs that could potentially cause um, illness and disease. Um, you can also see disruptions from uh, in the food supply as a result of, uh, you know, not just the fish contamination, but also the agricultural production, especially for communities that are reliant upon their local agriculture. Um, and maybe April, you could chime in here. Are the tribes that you work with, are they particularly reliant upon local agriculture? So we actually have, um, what are they called, where you don't have access to food, um, in extreme events. And so the, I know the Choctaws do quite a bit of food truck distribution during extreme events um, because many of their, you know, there's, they have to drive a ways to a Walmart or to um, different things. And so they have, um, what are they called where there's no food uh, distribution? Food is here. So they're, 
very vulnerable in these rural areas and where our tribal citizens are. Um, when Hurricane Harvey hit, um, the USDA um, stepped in and limited, so you weren't allowed to sell um, your crops or your uh, your beef, your cattle, and things like that that year. Um, and so there were definitely impacts there um, locally. Um, and same thing, um, many of these tribes that are providing or rely, their economy relies on, so I know in Louisiana, I was talking with them about, you know, the oil spill and their shrimping and crabbing um, or crawfish, right? And the salinity and changes. So when these impacts happen, it's impacting them directly um, and their their well being, their 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 economy. Right. And same thing. We have a lot of native farmers in our region. Um, many of the tribes have significant ag programs, whether it's cattle or bison, um, wheat operations. Right. So a tremendous amount of impacts. So when I look at the national literature, it really does focus on food and water um, as being some key impacts to prepare for. Uh, and you sort of alluded to also to some of the economic problems associated with drought. Um, and for some people that can lead to things like economic anxiety or other types of mental stress associated with drought, just the conditions changing, the loss of nature, the loss of um, economic and livelihood opportunities. Um, and then finally, last but not least at all, threats to tribal culture traditions and practices, uh, such as things like with drought comes a decline in native species, or as April had mentioned, a lot of the events or festivals that may be occurring in warmer weather months may be um, disrupted by extreme heat. Are there other uh, public health risks that you might throw in here, April, that we didn't cover? I think you already kind of went through a pretty good list earlier. No, I think that's a good sort of overview introduction to the types of things. Yeah. Okay, great. So I want to turn our attention then to, you know, at some point the tribes in the Southern Great Plains may turn to the, um, the point where they're ready to do vulnerability assessments or climate adaptation plans, or maybe they already have, and now they're looking to incorporate health as an aspect of maybe the next iteration. And so I'm gonna go through some resources that folks in the Southern Great Plains in particular can look to as they're developing these kinds of studies or reports. Um, and uh, I think they're, they're incredibly useful. I use these kinds of things as I write reports as direct reference material um, that I can add to uh, to my narrative pieces. And in some cases, I'm gonna share with you some experts that you can go to that can help you connect with um, other resources like data. So here's some national, some of the national reports I've been talking about. These are where I'm pulling some of this initial information. Uh, a key one, a pre um, sort of premier report in the nation was the fourth national climate assessment that was released um, in the last couple of years. Um, there's actually a particular chapter on the Southern Great Plains, so I've got a link there for you. Um, there's also something uh, in that national climate assessment called the Great Plains Highlights. So that's a short version of some of the key things you might want to know. So say, for example, you're trying to work with some decision makers in your community and you need some short talking points that are really getting to the heart of the matter. You could look at those highlights and pull some information quickly from those um, to share about some of maybe the urgency or, or importance of some of the climate impacts coming your way. Uh, the National Climate Assessment also has a Tribes and Indigenous Peoples chapter that's not particular to the Southern Great Plains region, but it's um, also a good piece of information. And another national report um, from the USDA is called Climate Change and Indigenous Peoples, a Synthesis of Current Impacts and Experiences. And I just really like this report. It's another good reference document. It isn't particular to Southern Great Plains, but they do a good job providing case studies from all over the country, which would include Southern Great Plains. Um, some of these also have good case studies um, that can help you connect with 
some of the tribes in your area that have had experiences or say like the, uh, maybe April might help me with the pronunciation, but the Oglala Lakota tribe, um, while sort of neighboring to your region, uh, they've been doing some work in developing climate adaptation into their sustainable development plans. So a few more reports that are actually developed from your region, not just at a national scale. Um, a lot of them seem like they're focused pretty specifically on agriculture. So there's a resilient Southern Plains agriculture and forestry in varying and changing climate, a conference report. I got, I got all of these out of the, um, the regional climate hub, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that is. Uh, Southern Great Plains assessment of vulnerability and preliminary adaptation and mitigation strategies for farmers, ranchers, and forest land owners. <clears throat> and then developing agricultural solutions for Southern Plains, responding to climate change and resource constraints. Um, so pretty good. What I, I didn't see a whole lot of is any particular regionally developed reports on that are specific to uh, maybe a more comprehensive vulnerability assessment. Um, but maybe April, if you're aware of those kinds of reports, you can share that with us as well. Speaking of April, so as we mentioned, April's from the South Central Climate Adaptation Science Center, among other organizations. Um, and so there are adaptation science centers all over the country. South Central has its own. Um, you can see a map there of the areas that it covers. Um, and so we're talking about Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, and April, is it true? Does it cover all of New Mexico? Yes. Okay. That is correct. All right. And so these science centers, typically they provide decision makers with science tools and information they need to address the impacts of climate variability and change on their areas of responsibility. Um, the South Central Climate Adaptation Science Center, in my experience, having worked with April and worked with them and brought a training to their area, um, is doing a lot with their Native American communities. And so there's a whole page um, on Native, uh, Native nations. <clears throat> and they have a whole list of climate adaptation and vulnerability assessment resources that you can go to. Um, do you want to share more on what South Central Climate Adaptation Science Center is doing, April? So I mentioned um, the three areas um, that we focus our tribal engagement uh, program on. Um, so the workforce development, we do uh, a lot of Native youth outreach and um, STEM education along climate change. So and we're free, we can come out to any of your tribal community. Um, youth outreach and uh, festivals or meetings and play with your kids <laughs> and education. Um, we do um, have um, Native students. So we've had 32 Native students work for us. And so we have them um, officed with us at the University of OU. Um, and so we um, have many tribal projects that they work on. Um, and so sometimes that's uh, that may be relevant for your community. We had a, for example, a student work on uh, looking at two inch rainfall events for three tribal um, governments in their emergency management events um, for their plans, their emergency management plans. Um, then we have our building capacity. So we have um, trainings that we host um, as asked and as needed uh, on a lot of different topics. And we're actually planning for our next climate 101 that will go more into uh, the region's climate um, and the resources and then how climate change is going to change and, um, and it's expected projected in our region. And so we're looking at doing that with the Alabama Cushata tribe and we have travel support as well for that. Um, so once the C-19 stuff <laughs> sort of um, lifts and all the restrictions, we'll be planning for that soon. Um, we're also planning a NASA Earth to Sky workshop, which is a, um, it's 50% it's NASA, but it's on climate education and communication. And 
so uh, tribes can apply as teams. So they come with a team of people they want to work with, and um, they're tasked with taking what they learn at the at the workshop and the NASA resources back to their tribal communities. Um, and so they have to come up with sort of what we call an action plan of what that might look like for them and what they want to do and and how how to implement it. And and we have. Um, what we call coaches, and so they will be assigned a coach to help them sort of plan for that and work through that. And, um, and so that is another event that we're planning. Um, and then we have, again, the research arm. So we fund tribal projects. We actually just funded a uh, culturally significant plants and climate change research symposium um, that we'll be planning. We actually just got funding. You mentioned the Ogallala um, and many of the tribal lands that are um, based, our homelands are um, a part of the Ogallala and the water supply concerns there. And so they're going to be engaging with tribes um, for that project. Um, so there's, um, and there we have an RFP. And so if there's, something that you're needing if you want to look at vectors in your region and how those things might change and what sort of is driving those changes. Um, we can go after funding for to look at those types of questions more in depth. So that's really helpful. Um, so for those kinds of things, April, I'm sorry to blast your picture up, um, but there, there she is. She's your she's your go to. Um, April, if you want to share specific links to those opportunities you just mentioned, I will include those at the end of this slide just um, and share those with the cohort members. Unfortunately, as you know, with C19, some of those things have been post uh, postponed. Um, yeah, we'll definitely um, send those out and include you all in your cohort um, once those things pick back up. Sounds good. Um, so you've got April's contact information here, as well as how to find her her website. Um, and she's again, she's with not just the South Central Climate Adaptation Center, but also the Chickasaw Nation and Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. So thank you, April. Another regional resource uh, is the Southern Climate Impacts Planning Programs. Um, that's based out of Norman, Oklahoma. There's the link for you. So it's one of the uh, NOAA RESA teams. It's a regional team. They have these all over the country as well. And so they're looking to increase the awareness of and preparedness for Southern US climate hazards, um, both present day and future conditions. And so they can do things like provide decision makers with climate hazard data um, and identifying critical areas of applied climate research. Uh, April, do you work with these guys at all? Absolutely. They're right across the street, um, and we actually partner on a lot of our trainings. Um, and so they have a little bit of a different mission. They do a lot of working with stakeholders and assessments of what are sort of the needs assessments, um, as it says here, stakeholder groups. Um, so they have a little different mission. Um, than we do. Um, so it just depends on what is appropriate to work with them on. Yep. And I mentioned the Southern Plain, the, the um, US Climate Hub. So it's actually administered by the USDA. They're all over the country as well. The Southern Plains has its own climate hub and it develops and delivers regional science-based information to partners and producers in Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas that enable climate smart decision making. So another place to go for resources and assistance as well. And then again, one more uh, sort of, of these regional sort of centers that can support local needs. Southern Regional Climate Center is actually, uh, this one's located in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and its mission is to increase the use and availability of climate data tools and information in the southern U.S. to help private and public sector constituents reduce risk and improve resilience um, to the impacts of climate change. So um, if it were me starting to do a vulnerability assessment, probably first go to April 
and get her advice about where the best data is locally. And then I'd probably browse around some of these data sources as well. Um, is this kind of a go-to for you, April, as well? Yeah, these are all great um, partners that I work with, again, um, so depending on what their sort of mission and what they provide. Um, but yeah, feel free to contact me and I'll um, put you in the right direction and the right contacts. Great. Actually, I'm going to, that one comes up a little bit later. Um, one of the health resources I wanted to make sure folks are aware of. Uh, we talked about it a little bit in the national webinar series um, is the Tribal Epidemiology Center. So as you can see on this map, there are 12 of these tribal epidemiology centers across the country. Um, for the Great Plains, they call um, their tribal epidemiology center, the Oklahoma Area Tribal Epidemiology Center. And that one covers Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas. But if you're in yeah, slightly to the west, there's an Albuquerque area um, tribal epidemiology center. And then if you're a little to the east, say in Louisiana, um, there you would be part of the United South and Eastern Tribal uh, Epidemiology Center. And so they're a great place to go for epidemiology information, which would mean public health kinds of data and information. So in my experience, they're doing a great job tracking as much as they can. Um, the tribal public health data, um, as if they can get as specific to get down to the boundary of the tribe, they do. And they work directly with tribes. So if you have technical assistance needs, they can help you analyze the data. They can fulfill data requests. There's a specific process um, to do a data request. And I know they have an interest in increasing their environmental health data and getting more and more into uh, climate change related indicators. So a couple of state um, specific resources uh, in Oklahoma, Oklahoma does have an assessment of the climate related needs of Oklahoma decision makers. So that's kind of a, you know, a statewide, that's as close as I could find it to a statewide vulnerability assessment called Making Decisions. And so that's a report that you can access through this uh, URL. And there's also a state climatologist named Gary McManus out of Norman, Oklahoma. And so his job is to acquire, process, and disseminate climate and weather data and information for use by Oklahoma citizens. And so there's a little snapshot of the website for the Oklahoma Climate Climatological Survey, which is uh, the organization he's a part of. Um, and you can contact him through that website. And then just a couple of resources here in, um, for Texas. Uh, the EPA created a little fact sheet for Texas climate and health resources. So it points you to a number of places that you can go for some health information. Um, and there's also a, the state climatologist uh, for Texas is named Dr. John Nielsen Gammon. He comes out of College Station, Texas. And um, there's a little snapshot of the website for, for that uh, out of the College of Geosciences with, I guess, Texas AMU. So that's where he's housed. And finally, there's the Texas Sea Grant out of College Station, Texas as well. And the Sea Grant is a good resource for potential funding opportunities as well as technical assistance as well. Um, for both Oklahoma and Texas, and actually I, the states in the Southern Great Plains, I looked at some of the public health, the state public health websites, and I didn't see a tremendous amount of information on, pub, on health and climate change impacts. Um, and so maybe they're Maybe they're working on that and some of the other cohorts, you know, the states are very active with climate and health. Um, and so uh, not as much, you, you may not have access to quite as much information on the health front. But it doesn't mean you couldn't reach out. You could reach out to your state, uh, your state public health department and find out if they have some information for you. Um, so those are the resources that I had come across that really jumped out to me as potentially being helpful if I were to be uh, working with a tribe doing climate adaptation work. Um, this could be just a limited conversation about some regional knowledge, experience, ideas, and needs just to get some inf more information from April since you're here and you're an expert. And so um, let's kind of tailor these to 
being more appropriate for our conversation. So you know, rather than hearing directly from tribes about um, how they have prepared or what their most concerning health impacts are, maybe you can tell us about any other resources that you would recommend for tribes that are, have been particularly useful for you um, and any of the biggest challenges that you're seeing tribes face as they try to do this kinds of work or any, anything else on this list that you think you could speak to. Yeah, um, so I just sent you, Angie, a, a report from SKIP that was focused on tribes, and they did these workshops to engage with tribal audiences about their needs around climate change. Hmm. Um, so I sent you that report as a one link um, of something that's been done in our region. Um, Great. I think um, what's interesting in our region is that um, tribes because it's not like they're in Alaska being directly impacted and living it today um, it's sort of a longer term um, experience um, so you see more of tribes trying to implement um, integrate climate into their existing planning whether that's in their tribal water plan or their emergency management plan or in this case, maybe um, considering it for their community health assessments um, and things like that. Yeah. Um, so as you mentioned, sometimes it's a little hard to to find those those really clear direct climate change. And I think one aspect of that is probably because of politics as well in this region that climate change um, in our society isn't um, so learning how to communicate about climate change um, and those impacts um, in, in creative ways. And so sometimes it takes a little more digging to find those resources. Um, and, but there are, there are plenty of examples of those types of things um, in, in this region. How are you, uh, so you work with the communities that have you know, attempted to move forward on some form of adaptation, right? Whether it's an adaptation plan or putting it into a different kind of planning um, paradigm. And are you, what kinds of, aside from politics, are there other challenges that they're facing in terms of getting those getting those things done? There's, there's so many challenges and so many examples of that. Um, and I, it's each tribe has their own things and their own priorities and their own um, challenges um, and things that they're dealing with um, in in some way, you know, whether it's their own capacity and turnover with tribes. Um, we've had a few projects where we've had at least three different tribal environmental staff. Um, so it's really hard to, to go back and sort of get them up to speed. Um, of what has been done and pick it up from there, uh, I think is one of the um, challenges of working in Indian country um, as well. Um, working with consultants and um, that were hired to bring in to, to get funding and then um, those sort of challenges as well. Um, um, leadership buy-in is another big one. Yeah. Um, so all sorts of challenges. <laughs> yeah, competing priorities, especially now with COVID. So I know a lot of tribes across the country are having a hard time getting attention on on uh, any ongoing processes for adaptation. Although um, what I'm hearing from some tribes is that the attention given to emergency preparedness is actually potentially helpful in preparation for climate change. Yeah, um, especially in our region, um, that's one area that I really see as an opportunity for us um, is the emergency management. We have quite a few tribal emergency management uh, staff. We have a, a group called the Intertribal Emergency Management Coalition, item C, um, and I'm always at that conference and involved. Um, and and so I really see that as one of my key focus areas. 
Uh, and maybe we could turn to some, you know, if there's po some positive stories coming out of the Southern Great Plains region in terms of tribes that, uh, even if they're not calling it climate adaptation, if they're enacting projects or have some kind of success stories, what strategies are working? You know, is there something that in the Southern Great Plains, other tribes could benefit from replicating? Yeah, um, so the Chickasaw Nation did a drought plan. And so they're looking at those sort of water scarcity issues um, and what communities are really struggling when those droughts hit. Um, and what was interesting, I think, for me is they, they're they working with their water suppliers across the jurisdiction. So it's not one community for themselves. It's um, there's a source or a water supply and there's multiple communities across the landscape that um, rely on that water source. Um, and so really um, leading that effort to get those communities to work together and um, communicate, make decisions and and understanding that what they each community does during a drought impacts the other communities. and. And so those really difficult decisions and conversations um, across the landscape um, as well. Um, another great example that I um, really, as you mentioned, they don't call it climate adaptation because in a way tribes have been adapting and lived off the landscape for since their origins. Um, and so for me, uh, tribal seed banking is a really key um uh, adaptation option uh for this region um they've been doing this with the tribal alliance for pollinators and um so trying to restore milkweed and butterfly habitat and making um and so they're already considering ways to change the way they restore those things and across the landscape and on a larger scale and multiple tribes I think they started out with seven tribes, a part of that alliance, and they have tribes from all across the country coming to those meetings. Um, and so those those needs to really think outside of, um, you know, droughts aren't just a, a Chickasaw problem, it's across the landscape. It's um, droughts occur, you know, in multiple different um, regions, like California droughts, you know, it's not, um, so how do we work at a larger scale and with other tribes and partner and collaborate? Um, I think there's some great examples of that here in the Southern Plains region. Um, I mentioned the Intertribal Emergency Management Coalition and them, you know, doing these conferences and learning and providing capacity building and working together and um, helping each other out across the region when they're events happen when Harvey happened, the tribes call to action. Um, they all rally and go. Um, they help each other out. They're present. They have these um, sort of, sometimes you even see a, a more formal memorandum of agreement where they're going to be there and help you out um, in those situations. And so it's really cool to see that sort of happening as well. Is there a way for tribes who aren't already part of those efforts to sign up or subscribe or join uh, one of these coalitions or collaborations? Like I said, there's the big conference and meeting for the emergency managers. Um, and so they're always, um, every year I go to that, it's always, I mean, been really impressive of how that's grown and developed. Same thing with that Tribal Alliance for Pollinators group. Yeah. I mean, they, really continue to grow and, um, and so yeah there's plenty of opportunities for those things and then um, I know you know the climate resilience toolkit does a good a good job of collecting case story case stories by region or case studies um, but is anybody in your region uh, collecting and compiling um, example materials so say you know you mentioned there's some good strategies, some good projects. Um, is there a place that tribal community members can go to look at those projects and learn more so they could try to replicate them? 
So my my perspective on that. So yes, there those types of tools or resources are great, and we try to bring in speakers from other tribes to share um, and things like that. But for me, you know, it, those types of resources have to be maintained and and housed and um, the funding to go toward development of tools like that and how useful are they for the time and resources that it takes to develop something like that. Um, I, I obviously have a good list internally, yeah. I know. But the other sort of thing for me is it's you have to get permission for the tribes to tell their own story. Yeah. Right. So for me, you know, I'm for Chickasaw Nation, I'd have to go through their process to be able to share that. That's theirs to share. Um, so I can direct you to their drought planning and their drought resources and learn about that. They have a website for that right? Um, type of thing. Um, so it just depends on what type of um, examples of adaptation options you're looking for um, and where that is. But no, we don't have a... <laughs> A sort of place where here's all the tribal adaptation or even the non tribal adaptation strategies and options and things that are being done in our region. Um, you know, the BIA also has a tribal resilience map that they try to just based on their awards, they're tracking the kinds of projects that are happening all across the country. So people could look at that map. So that's just the BIA funded stuff. Yeah, right. So they just have. And I don't know. I mean, so, you know, you could go to each agency to see if they have a, a, a place where they house what all has been funded from there. Um, so, for example, the Bureau of Rec and their drought planning um, and who they funded, you'd have to go to each FEMA, right, who, which yeah. tribes have been funded to do emergency management plans. Um, so, right. Well, it sounds like, uh, you know, if I were somebody working with a tribe in Southern Great Plains and I was like, I want to learn how this, I heard somebody did seed banking and I want to learn more about how they did it. and so I can, you know, accelerate my process a little bit. I'd probably just go to you and say, April, can you connect me? <laughs> I'd be happy to. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, you did also a good job talking about those examples of strategies, also talking about some of the partnerships that have been forming between tribes and between sort of multidisciplinary agencies. So thank you for that. Is there any other local um, knowledge that you would like to share any anything else that you think tribes should be aware of um i'm sure there's a lot but key resources or um key projects key um successes nothing i can think of at this time that, um okay great well yeah that was super helpful um, I'm going to take just a little bit of time to go through some of our tools that we've designed to be a companion to the training that you all are going through the national webinar series and to some extent these cohort meetings. Um, so I'm actually going to step out of here and show you how to navigate around our website for a moment. So this is the Tribal Climate Health Project website. Maybe you've already been to it. There's a few places that I really want to make sure you're aware of to go to. And they're pretty much all under this subheading learn. And so under learn, you could go to one of the first things we de developed, which was the resource clearing house. This resource clearing house houses up to, I think around 500 resources to date. We're trying to keep it updated. So anything that might have some relevance to tribal communities, climate change and health and or health. So it, brushes across one, two, or three of those categories, then um, we're trying to put it here. And it's a filterable um, inventory of resources. So you could cover, you could sort by topics covered. So say, I just want to know about health impacts. I just want to know about things that are particular to Native American communities. I want to know something specific about how to do vulnerability or risk assessments. So those are the kinds of topics you could filter by. You could filter by materials available. 
you know, what is it a case study? Is it a, a toolkit? Is it a sample plan? And you could also sort by resource type. And then if you want to look specifically at your area, um, on this website, we would call folks in the Southern Great Plains South Central, and you could click there and hit submit, and then you would see the resources that are available that are specific to your region. But now that I've gone through this process of digging a little deeper, I actually have some more materials to upload for your region. And that will happen soon. Along with the clearinghouse is a map. And so those things that do have a specific location attached to them, we were able to geocode basically and throw on a map here. So if you wanted to go and scan and look what's available for your region, you could dive a little deeper on this map. Mostly though, I wanna spend our time pointing you to training materials. So um, we've done quite a few trainings for over 800 professionals across the country so far in the last several years. And you can find all the materials for all of those trainings um, on this page. More importantly, some of these companion tools are what I wanna point your attention to. Uh, one of our key tools that we developed is called the Exposures, Impacts, and Strategies Inventory Tool, the easy tool. Uh, we're actually gonna dive more into this on our next national webinar session um, in just a couple of weeks. But let me, I'm gonna spend a little bit more time just on this cohort call, just making sure that you're aware of how to download it and how to use it. So this was a customizable companion tool that's really was designed based on the experiences we were having, collecting all of this information about climate change and health impacts and trying to figure out how to communicate this to tribes that are working on vulnerability assessments and, and climate adaptation and thinking rather than just throw a bunch of information at trainees, it would be better to organize this information into a tool that helps folks walk through the process of determining the severity and likelihood of various exposures and impacts specifically to their community with real data sources and allows them to make some decisions about how to adapt. So all you would do here is click on the link and it will take you to an opportunity to download it. So here it is down on my screen. You can open it up. This is the latest version. We still consider it um, a beta version as we're continuously working on it. Um, but it is available for you to use. So let me pull this over. It's in Excel. So if you're not an Excel lover, it may seem like a lot. Um, but there are three main tabs that I want to point your attention to. So the first step typically in doing a vulnerability assessment of any kind um, is to evaluate your exposures. And so this tab allows you to do that and it allows you to actually do some filtering by region. So if all you did was to just go in here and filter by your region, you could actually, so in here we call it Great Plains, you could filter by Great Plains. It would filter for the exposures that, the exposures and secondary exposures that would be more, most significant for the Great Plains region. Along with that, it would give you an opportunity to look at a pretty long inventory or menu of, in, of exposure indicators, meaning, all right, if I wanna know how badly drought is going to affect my particular community, what are some metrics I can use to measure the changes that are occurring um, in drought? Um, and so, you can shoot, you don't have to do all of these, but here's a menu of some of the best practices from the literature and research that we've conducted in building our curriculum. And so these are some ways that you can sort of uh, identify whether or not dry, drought is a problem for you. And so along with that comes a series of links. So national data sources, um, we do a lot of work in California, so there's a whole set for California data sources, but um, we basically have a the setup as a worksheet that you could add in information um, based on historical data, baseline data, and projected data. And that will give you an opportunity to look where there is data to look across trends and to see what changes are occurring. So you can kind of see what the level of risk is that's, um, that you should be preparing for. And over here, you would just mark high, medium, low, or none. And in our webinar series, we'll talk a little bit more about how 
how to engage your community into making these kinds of decisions. But capturing the data is a, can be an overwhelming task, and we've hoped that we've made it slightly less complicated by suggesting and recommending some indicators and some data sources for you to take a look at. By all means, if you have something local that's better, we encourage you to use it. It's best to use as location-specific information as you can. Some of these sources can maybe only go down to the county level. Still somewhat meaningful, but not as meaningful as if you had something that was particular to your tribal boundary. The same kind of thing um, we do for impact. So not every, not every climate vulnerability tool or process um, goes into this level of detail, but we wanted to say, okay, well, now we know the exposures and secondary exposures. Let's um, take an inventory of the potential impacts that communities should be looking out for and give people an opportunity to look at the indicators for that and where there is data, measure it. And so same kind of thing you can sort, you can sort by region, you can sort by exposure, you can sort by impact type. And so here, since we're looking at impacts, you could look at human health, cultural and spiritual health, socioeconomic health, natural environment, or built environment. So this isn't made exclusive to just health, but it does have a pretty big focus on health. And so, you know, for example, here's one possible impact of temperature extremes would be heat related stress, which we've talked about. So how then might you measure how bad, how severe and likely heat related illness would come to your community? Well, here's a variety of indicators that you could use to measure that and some data sources that we're aware of that you could go to um, to figure out your historical baseline and projected um, trends. And as you go through here, you have the same opportunity by impact to rank your impact vulnerability level. So at the end of the day, what you're really trying to do is say, all right, I've looked at all the information on all the potential impacts, and I have had an opportunity to prioritize the ones that are most concerning so that we can act upon it. And so that's what this is intended to help you do. This is not something you have to use, but if it can shortcut the process for you, rather than having to go reinvent the wheel and do all the research yourself, we'd be very happy if you make use of it. Um, I'll point this quickly to a big part of determining impact vulnerability will be population sensitivity and adaptive capacity. We'll talk more about this in the webinar series, but um, this is a whole list of potential population sensitivity and adaptive capacity indicators. So what those mean is basically how the impacts that we foresee coming your way will be modified in terms of severity by certain community characteristics, some that make you more sensitive to the climate changes that are occurring, and some that make you more prepared or increase your capacity to adapt. And so... Um, you can actually just, right here, we're just tracking baseline information, but there's a lot of different resources you could go to to look at things like um, population age, ages, um, population living in a high-risk wildfire area, population living in a 100-year flood area, poverty rate, all these kinds of things that moderate uh, vulnerability levels. And then finally, once you've determined what are the most concerning impacts or vulnerabilities for you, you have an opportunity to do an adaptation plan. An adaptation plan is really um, a, a way, as you know, usually a stakeholder-led process where you're determining the best strategies to address those vulnerabilities. And so we've here taken inventory of about 130 possible adaptation strategies that you might consider from, you know, we've mined these from other communities We've mined them from the literature. And so this isn't an exhaustive list, but it's um, perhaps better than brainstorming from square one. And so you could look at these, sort them by um, which exposures or impacts that they may help address. Um, and you can also sort them by the strategy type. So we categorize them by things like policy planning and land use or infrastructure improvements. And there's six different categories. So this one is designed to actually help you decide if this is something you're, you know, are you already doing this strategy? Is it something you want to consider? And if it is something you want to consider, you can evaluate 
those strategies on a couple of different, using a couple different criteria, basically for us need and feasibility. Because at this stage, you probably won't have the resources to do full cost benefit analysis of each of the strategies that you want to consider putting in your adaptation plan. But a, a high level review just to eliminate any fatal flaws or anything that's just unreasonable is a, is a good idea. And so this just is a worksheet to help you do that. And then you can also do some preliminary planning in terms of trying to figure out if we do do this, if this is a new strategy, what's our time frame for implementation? Is it one year? Is it three years? Is it up to 20 years? And then you could consider things like who's responsible for implementation and what resources you might have to dedicate towards it and um, what potential funding needs you may have. And then down the line, you could actually use this to track your percent complete if you decide to move forward with any of these. So those are some uh, tools that can really help you both through the vulnerability assessment process and the adaptation planning process. Couple more resources before we go. And April, I know that you you know about these resources, so um, <laughs> you don't have to keep hanging out with me if you don't want to, but um, you're free to chime in. Uh, I wanna share with you the survey template. So like we talked about during the last webinar series session, we talked about community engagement as part of the vulnerability assessment process. Well, we have a survey and it's called the Climate Vulnerability Experiences and Priorities Survey. And it's really just a Google form. And all you'd have to do, uh, you can look at it here. And if you want to, you can download a copy of it for yourself that you can edit and change as much as you'd like. The intention here is to have something free and easy to use that's online um, that you can distribute to your community and can customize it as much as you'd like. This can be a good way to get things like testimonials, perspectives, experiences, observations on what climate changes, um, how climate change is already affecting your community members, what they're concerned about, what stories they may wanna share with you and how they might prioritize certain community assets. So take a look at that when you have a moment and it could also be useful even if you wanna do more deep engagement with your stakeholders, you could use some of these questions in um, you know, in an interview format, in a workshop format, uh, more in person. Um, but potentially, since you know, in person isn't really a, happening as much right now, um, an online survey could really go a long way. Hi, Angela. Yes. So I think that's a great resource um, and a good starting point for some of the the smaller communities. Uh, we actually have. Um, several communities in our um, in Oklahoma that have done uh, survey type uh, approaches. Um, so the Delaware Nation uh, is an example of one. If you wanted to see or talk with them, I can put them in touch with them. Um, so they did a lot of surveying and community engagement to get input to where they should focus their climate adaptation planning and what was the the citizens sort of priorities and interest um, and what are they seeing on the ground? Um, yeah, I would love, I'd love to learn more about what they did and they sound like a potentially good speaker for a training sometime. And with Sack and Fox, we did, um, we brought in a film crew. And so we, so I sat and interviewed uh, community members at one of their language festivals. Hmm. And so they have a wonderful video that um, resulted out of that, of, of interviewing and surveying their, their community. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, really, my experience, it depends on the level of resources available to a community, how deep uh, of engagement a community can go. The deeper, the better, in terms of actually tailoring a climate adaptation plan to the needs and, and uh, priorities of the community. And then some folks just, um, are two straps. I think it could be a very time consuming process. So sort of we encourage as much as you could possibly do. Here's one, you know, here's one resource to get you started and to get you thinking about what kinds of questions you might ask. But yeah, if you um, send any links along that you can April, that would be great. I'll include them here as well. Great. 
Um, finally, there's some sample reports. Um, Paula, who is the lead for the Tribal Climate Health Project, has done a vulnerability assessment and adaptation plan. Both of these reports are here that are downloadable in Word. The intention here is that all the formatting, the references, even some of the text, however much of it you can use. Of course, you have to customize it for your own community. But if any of it is useful, it's up for you to use. Um, and so sometimes some of the hard work comes into the nuts and bolts of developing a report. And then uh, some examples of Paula's fact sheets. So after it completed its adaptation plan, it also developed some community education around its four main exposure areas. So you can see um, an example of some community outreach materials. And then we also have a link here to ITEP's climate change resolution template, which we recommend folks use when they're trying to get early buy-in or adoption of their vulnerability assessments and adaptation plans. I really uh, use those for um, the BIA funding, right? You have to have a resolution to go after the funding. Um, and so um, they're really useful for, for getting funding. Yes. Yeah, I think this last time they may have only required a letter for some of the some of the proposals, but um, but yeah, I mean, anytime you anytime you don't have to start from scratch, the better, right? <laughs> so that's kind of what a lot of this page is about. Don't start from scratch. All right. So um, yeah, in the absence of having tribal folks here to ask any additional technical assistance questions. Uh, I'll just ask you, April, if there's anything else that you think folks would want to know about on a call like this. No, I think these, as you know, Angie, I've uh, been a part of the planning team on these things and watched these things develop. And as you guys have um, developed these, and I think these are great sort of starting points and to learn from what you guys have done. Um, Well, thanks, April, and thanks for all your help over the years. Um, so any additional resources that I've learned about over this call, um, I'll be sure to add to this last page of, um, oops, this last page here on the slide deck. We're gonna distribute the slides as well as the recording of this session. And I wanna thank April so much for your um, expertise and for being with us today. And um, for those of you who couldn't make it, that's totally fine. We hope you're doing well in your community amidst all this pandemic business. Um, feel free when this material gets shared to share it more broadly with others outside of your own tribe or even within your own team, uh, because we hope that this material and this information is really helpful for folks as they make their way through preparing for climate change and health impacts. Okay, well, thank you so much for your time there at home, and um, we'll be seeing you back on the webinar series. Take care.